very thankful to have the opportunity this morning to share with you guys. Uh, it was something that I didn't know that I'd get a chance to do again, but I'm glad to. I've had a few opportunities in the last couple months to, uh, to preach at different places. And it's one thing when you walk into another place and, uh, and they're looking at you and they don't know you. You know, and they're like, oh, this guy must know something because somebody asked him to come here, you know. And so you've got sort of this uh, pretense of knowledge. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have that here. Thankfully, you know that, okay. You know me. You know my, uh, my shorts, my shorts, my faults, my shortcomings, all those sorts of things. So as I take the opportunity this morning to share... Um, I ask that you, you take that in and that you remember that it's, it's just me talking. Um, and uh, what I share is, does not come from a place of having attained some great level of godliness, but from being a man on the journey with all of you, seeking to grow and come to a greater glorification of Christ in this life. And so... Uh, it's my privilege to have this opportunity, and uh, we're going to be looking in Second Peter, nope, First Peter, this morning, First Peter chapter two. Following on where Nick has left off, and we are in verses one through eight. First Peter chapter two, verses one through eight. So I'm going to read these, and then we'll pray. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. For a holy priesthood, to offer up a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come together this morning, as we open up your word and we read, we read this truth that we know is important for us. Lord, we know that we want to be a part of this spiritual house described in these verses, I pray that you might, in humility, draw us closer to you, that you might give us a renewed love and passion for your truth, and Lord, that we, through the lives that you have given us and the talents and the gifts that we would desire to offer our spiritual sacrifices from our heart to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we start looking here at this chapter in 1 Peter, we just have to give a little bit of a, um, a kind of an overview or maybe a, a lens by which I'm going to be reading the book of Peter and through which I'm going to be looking to apply these verses as well. So when I look at the book of Peter, the broad lens that I'm taking for and grabbing from Peter is this idea of a Christian ethic. It's a Christian ethic, a way of life for believers who have signed up to follow the way. They've signed up to follow Jesus with their lives. They've left behind the world, and they have one goal and one aspiration to become more conformed to the image of Christ. And so, to me, 1 Peter then lays out the Christian ethic for a believer, both from his identity, sharing a living hope with others, 
finding his identity in Christ, but also finding his identity with other believers. So we're going to see a chosen people here in chapter 2. And then with other believers walking into the world, facing the trials and the struggles that this world has to offer, but doing so, holding Christ as the example. So what does that look like in your workplace? What does that look like in your family? What does that look like when you deal with authorities and rulers over you? Here's what it looks like. Peter identifies his recipients as aliens or as strangers who've been exiled. They're scattered. When we hear that, we think, okay, he had somebody in specific in mind, but we can, we can commiserate with that. We know he's also talking to us. We are strange, and not just because of who we are. We're strange because of what we love. We're strange because we follow a set of principles and a lifestyle outlined for us in the scriptures. And we live in a world that does not necessarily accept our way as the right way. So we are scattered, and we need this ethic, and we need to know why we should live for this hope and how it looks like in our life. So that's the kind of the lens that I see when I'm reading 1 Peter. And that brings us to 1 Peter chapter 2. So let's look at these verses. I'm going to, uh, those of you who, who do know me and know how I preach, you would know that eight verses in 30 minutes is going to be a stretch. So, yeah. Oh, I got 35. We're in good shape. Here we go. Uh, I don't really have points, except I do. So here's the first one. Uh, a house of stones, if you want to take some notes. A house of stones. That's what's how I'm going to kind of broadly categorize this, weird, this section of verses in First Peter. It's, a, it's an interesting illustration, uh, but it's an illustration of this building that God is building with stones that are alive and are you and I for his purpose. It's a house of stones. Now, it's a strange illustration, but it's not too strange. Uh, I'm just going to flip here quick to Ephesians 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple, in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So it's, a, it's an interesting example of living stones, but it's also an example that Paul uh, uses similarly in a way to say that uh, believers are being built up together for a purpose, and as Peter describes, a purpose to offer up sacrifices before the Lord. A house of stones. Uh, we're switching to now in First Peter, maybe a focus on one another. So I want us to grasp that there's, a, there's now this idea that you're not just a believer who's experienced a living hope, but really see that you are a part of a community of believers, uh, whether it's your local or the global, but you are now together in a house, God's house. It's a real big house with lots and lots of rooms. That's an old song. Uh, so, okay. So to grasp this idea of being together in a house, I want us to track where, where Peter starts to change and starts to get us thinking about collectively as a group. So let's jump up to back to chapter 1 and verse 20, and we know that we were redeemed by nothing perishable but something imperishable the precious blood of christ verse 20 jesus he was foreknown before the foundation of the world he's appeared in these last times who through him you all are believers in god so we're there's a lot of you all sort of verbs in here a lot of uh, plural idea so now we're we're really believers in god we're we're a group of of believers in god 
who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that by faith and hope are in God. Since you are, have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Okay, so here we get this idea again. Collectively, we're, we're, our goal is to love the brothers uh, because we've been obedient to the truth of the gospel. Fervently then, especially fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. So, so we all believers have been redeemed by an imperishable word. Uh, that is God's truth. That is his gospel. We've all been redeemed by it. Uh, think about the fact that it's imperishable. We've been redeemed by this imperishable thing which makes us have an inheritance which is imperishable. So imperishable has this idea of what? Like a long time? So all of us believers all together share this really long time redemption, which means that we're together for like a really long time. All of us believers for a really long time, sharing an imperishable thing together. Together for a really long time. Okay? We went on vacation with some friends for two weeks. It wasn't long enough or it wasn't, uh, I don't know how to say it. it. It wasn't too long. Something like that. Okay. We're together for a really long time. What will break that apart? Now let's get into our verses then. 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you all believers together, put off malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Okay, what breaks apart? What can destroy this community of togetherness that God is building with his believers and followers of his son. What can break it is, as Peter describes it, malice, which is wickedness, but in context with this togetherness is more like a a wickedness and a hatefulness and a malice towards one another, anger and hatred towards others. That'll destroy and corrupt and pollute this sort of community. Uh, deceit and hypocrisy. Deceit. To try to trick someone else. To try to deceive someone else. To try to uh, pull one over their eyes. To try to lie. I mean, all these things tear apart trust. Trust. You can't have relationships without trust. Hypocrisy. It's a another form of deceit, but it's a and maybe it's it looks a little bit like everybody having it all together on Sunday morning. Making everybody else feel like they have to have it together on Sunday morning. Because they don't want to look like they don't have it together like that person has it together. And it keeps everybody from being sincere or genuine about the struggles and the difficulties of their walk, the doubts that they have. Envy and slander. If you want the glory that someone else has, if you want the if you want their position, if you want their power, their influence, if you If you want what they have, if you're willing to tear others in the community down behind their backs, those things tear apart. They destroy. They cause division. They don't build up a community. We want to be a house of stones. And the house of stones here, this illustration starts... In verse 4, coming to him then as to a living stone, 
which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Here, Jesus is the living stone. He is the example of what we are to be. That is, that is Jesus. Uh, we are to follow him. He's been set before us. His life was not attractive to everyone. What he was willing to suffer, what he gave up, what he lived for and what he looked after, not everybody wanted that. He would also be a, a rock of offense to others. He would also be a stumbling block to others. But for those who have believed in his name, he is the living stone. He is the only stone from which we can get life from. Therefore, we come together and we come to him to plant ourselves on a living stone. A living stone, as verse 5 says, uh, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We come to them, we come to this stone to be built upon the stone for a purpose. We share this purpose. We want to be this house of stones that is effectively offering glory, honor, and sacrifices before the Lord. Similar to what Romans chapter 12 says, uh, as Paul says, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and a holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Like, here we are. Jesus has offered his spiritual act of service and worship, and we come to him together, collectively, we want to offer that as well. We mentioned that it wasn't for everyone, but for everyone who comes to this living stone to offer spiritual sacrifices is the only thing for them. Like that is why we have come here. And then it, its effectiveness goes on beyond where I get to go today into verses 9 through 12. But there, you know, the, the effectiveness of this house of living stones is that uh, they show themselves to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for God's own possession. Uh, they were not a people, verse 10, but now you are a people of God. So, so the world sees this house, and now he just changes metaphors or whatever. Now they see this nation of people who, who are strange in the sense that they, they don't share the same last name. They don't come from the same region. They don't have the same skin color. They don't share the same family. This is a strange people gathered together, but they are a people that the world can see. And verse 12 says, So then, this new nation of God's people are to keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may be, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. So from outside this community, this house of stones, the world can look in at these strange people and they will give glory to God because of what they see is different in their lives. Now, how do we look in a little deeper at these verses? And I guess it'd be a quick overview how do we look deeper at them? There's, there's so many ways. It could be so much fun to look at the cracks in the house. Huh? Like, how about anybody seen Encanto? It's a, I'm sorry, it's, it is a Disney movie, but I did watch it. Um, yeah, well, it's a house with cracks, and that's a really bad thing for the house. It falls apart. Um, yeah, we could look at why are there... Why would there be cracks? Why would there be this disunity described in verse 1 in the house of God? But we're not going to do that today. We don't have time. We could look at the offense of Jesus. That would be a fun one. Why is Jesus such an offensive figure? 
And do we try to show the world how offensive Jesus is in the sense of what he asks us to give up and how he asks us to live? Yeah, it's another good one. We're not. We're going to look at how can we bring these stones to life? Okay, somebody give me a descriptive word for a stone, please. Yes. Excellent. A descriptive word for a rock and a stone. Solid. Ooh, good. Strong. Okay. Unmovable. Okay. Any others? All right. That rock won't float. <laughs> yeah. Let's stick with a few of them. Solid, sturdy, and unmovable. Huh? How about those ones? Not usually living. It could be easy for me to be a stone. How many of you it would be easy to be a stone? Like the solid, unmovable, don't do a whole lot stone. I mean, if that's a job description and I could get paid handsomely for it, I'll take that on. I could sit in that corner all day. I bet. Just watch me. Okay, how do we bring stones to life? Because this is a, if we are the kind of stones that this verse is talking about, it's a stone that is alive. It's a stone that's doing something. It's not just sitting stagnant, collecting moss or getting beaten up by the world and the waves that are coming at it. It's, it's alive. How do we bring stones alive? So let's go back and start again. Peter says that we should put off all these things that destroy a community. But he does say, you probably noticed I skipped over this part for a reason. He does say what we should be doing then. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be destroying the body of Christ, but we should be doing something else. We should be like newborn babies longing for the pure milk of the word. We should be like newborn babies longing for the pure milk of the word. Now, that's the New American Standard. And, uh, and you may, if you're having the ESV, you, you're going to have like spiritual milk. Some of you are looking at longing for the spiritual milk. So just quickly, this, this passage shows how clumsy our English language is compared to the Greek. And the idea here is that a, you should be like a newborn baby that longs for the pure, wordy, truthy milk. The pure logosy milk, like we've heard logos before. Logos, the word of God, is the same word that's up here in verse. Um, oh boy, verse twenty-three, through the living and enduring word of God, that logos idea. That is by which you have been uh, uh, born from. This word was preached to you. This is this gospel. This word. Logos was preached to you. Now you as newborn babies must desire this Logosy milk, this wordy milk. We should long for milk as much as a baby longs for milk. And we know those of us who have had children, those who are having, still having children. There comes a time when a child wants its milk. It's about that time like when I want dinner. It's whining, it's complaining, it's like uh, hangry. That's a word, isn't it? Yeah. We should be that all the time for the gospel truth, for the word of God. And when we say the word of God, we're not just saying for the Bible itself, right? Where this is, yes, we should long for the Bible, but we should long for this 
God truth word, this word of God that has come to us. It's not just a book. It's the truth of God's love. It's the message of when God broke through history and sent his son. It's the one that said, it's for all. It's the one that said, I can save you no matter where you are. I can redeem you and change you. I can make you new. It's the truth that, that came alive in us and said, there is something for you in the love of God and in a purpose for your life. It's, this is the gospel. It's, it's what changed us and it's what can change others It's the word of God, the truth, the truth of who we are and who we can be in Christ. We must long for that. We must love that. We need to renew our desire for the gospel. We need to see what that looks like, that truthy milk in our lives. We must see how it happened to us and we must follow the example of Christ, who was the Word. Even Peter will say later on in these verses uh, that you've been called for this purpose uh, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you to follow in his steps. So Jesus, the Word of God, was the example for us to follow in his steps. He committed no sin, nor was there deceit found in his mouth. And while he was reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. This word of truth, this gospel message was revealed in Christ in the way he lived, in the way he spoke, his message, his life. And part of that was suffering. And part of that was trials. Peter already explained suffering trials in the beginning of the book and yet constantly entrusting his life to God. That's a crazy example for us to follow. What does it practically look like to begin to love the word? To desire again that gospel message, to have that spurn up in us a desire to have it flow out. Well, what does it look like? It, it Practically, we keep reading in verse 2, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Okay, grow in respect to salvation. That's how um, New American Standard has it. Again, a couple interesting things with the translation and the way it comes out. Uh, we'll just keep this concept of growing like you are supposed to grow in your salvation. We could call that sanctification, I guess. But you must realize or wonder, how do you define your salvation? How do you define your salvation? Do you define your salvation as like a club that you're a part of? I am in the saved club. Is it like a ticket to ride? Like, I've got my ticket for the salvation. I'm ready to present it at Judgment Day and have it stamped. Is salvation mean to you a place where you're going to go? Like salvation is, is this ethereal heavenly kingdom that is out there? In some aspects... All of those things are kind of true. Another aspect of salvation is this process of growth towards godliness. This life that is lived, begun at a destination or a point in time where you received Christ into your hearts, and now is a process of conforming yourself to the image of Christ, or as First Peter has already said, if you want to be called, uh, what was it, as obedient children... Don't be conformed to your former lusts, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. A process of conforming ourselves to the image of Christ. 
So if we say we're going to grow up into salvation, we might say that we're going to grow in our image and conformity towards God. Longing for and looking forward to that day when he sets all things right and we can see what it will actually look like. So we're going to grow in respect to salvation. How and why? If we've tasted the kindness of the Lord. Have you tasted the kindness of the Lord? That will begin to grow you into salvation. What do I mean again? Let's, like, what do you think the kindness of God is? The kindness of God is mercy and his love for us? Yes. How was God's mercy and love shown to you? In this gospelly, truthy way, how was God's love and mercy shown to you? How was his kindness, his goodness shown to you? Okay? Sacrifice on the cross. So let's go a little deeper. How was the sacrifice of the cross shown to you? He didn't have to? Good. And who helped share that message that he didn't have to and that he died on the cross with you? Did God use someone in your life? Did God bring someone alongside you in a Sunday school class to give up of their time and open up God's word with you? Did someone show up at a vacation Bible school and spend time with you, opening up the word and teaching you its truth? Did someone reach out to you and offer you acceptance and love at a time when you didn't really deserve it? Did someone come to you in your life and forgive you for a sin that you thought shouldn't have been forgiven and could never be changed? How was the kindness and the goodness of God exhibited to us? Through his word and in his way, in a message, but that message was often conveyed through people. Through people who loved you. Through people who began to align their lives in more conformity with the gospel of Christ and who were now truthy lovers because they had experienced the love of God and it bubbled out of them. It was, it was who they are. They couldn't contain it. They couldn't contain the love of God inside them. They couldn't be just a, a rock stuck on the ground. Like it, it just came out. How could I not love everybody? God loved me and I'm a jerk, you know? How can I not forgive others? God forgave me. If I can't forgive somebody else, how can I not extend mercy? How was the kindness of God shown to you? How do we grow in respect to the gospel truth? It becomes what we long for. It becomes what we desire. And then it just flows out of us. Do you desire that gospel truth? That logos truth? Is it your life and your sustenance? What does it look like? It looks like a reflection in your life of tasting the kindness of God. Showing it out to others. And now we keep going and we say, so if we can be alive, if we can be living stones, following the example of Christ, all these things that we've said, if we can be these living stones, what's next? What's next? We'll keep moving on there. Uh, so the New American Standard says it like this. You also, as living stones, so we've regained, all of us re renewed our living lifeness. 
are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Are being built up. Uh, here's how it could also be said. Allow yourselves to be built up. Like this is a passive idea. Like you, now you're, now you're a stone that's alive. Ah, I'm a little stone that's alive. You still don't have legs, I guess. I don't know. You can't build yourself. God is going to build you. Let him build you into his spiritual house. Let him place you into his house. Why is it important to let him place us now into this house, into his spiritual kingdom, into this building? Why does he have to place us? Well, because it's his. And because it's not yours. It's his house. So we stones, I don't know how to do it, uh, alive. We don't get to say, I can't be next to him. You have got to be joking me. I'm just going to... No. You were placed there. You're in this house. Okay? There's no possible way this stone next to me can offer any sort of spiritual sacrifice to the Lord. I, I, I can see that there's... Lord, you put somebody in the wrong spot. Maybe he should be an interior wall, you know. Or maybe there's a separate wing for these people. Like, let us give our praise here. No. It's God's house. Let him build you. We don't worry about the building of the house. That's God's building this house for his spiritual praise and honor. And he can use vessels that we don't understand. And he can use ways and means that we don't understand to bring about a spiritual sacrifice to himself. We let ourselves be built. We do our part. We offer up our sacrifice the reason that we are alive, the reason that he made us different, unique, specially gifted, talented for a purpose so that we can glorify him with our living stony life. We let him build us and we do our part. We do it as unto and for the Lord. Just turn over a couple pages to chapter 4, verses 8 through 11, and realize that in about 30 minutes, I've been able to say exactly what Peter will say in four verses. I'm apologizing for that. Above all things, uh, let's go to 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God. Whoever serves is to do so as one who is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belongs glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. There we have it. I think if you come back tonight, my dad's going to be here. He looks a little like me, except old. Uh, but he's going to be preaching about spiritual gifts, he said. 
Okay, so I'm not going to take time to try and think about all the spiritual gifts. I'm just going to say maybe Peter breaks them up into the serving gifts and the teaching or the speaking gifts. But that's just something I, whatever. But if you want to hear more about that, come tonight. But I will say this. That I cannot do what you can do. I can't do what you can do. I can't bring to the table what you bring to the table. I can't bring to the table your sufferings and your hardship. I can't bring to the table the cancer that you've dealt with. I can't bring to the table any of that. I bring this stone. If God's gifted me to teach every once in a while, then I bring this gift that he's given to me and I'll use it whenever I can, as he's described it, voluntarily, freely, eagerly, as much, as often, whenever he gives me the chance. It's, it's who I am. He's, he's made me that way. And I've got to surrender myself to lift up and offer my praise and sacrifice in that way to him whenever and however I can. But so do you. You know what I'm terrible at? Following up. Or actually getting things completed. That's me. Some of you guys are amazing at that. Some of you have the ability to show so much love. If we've tasted the kindnesses and goodness of God, if we've experienced the love of someone else that shared God's love with us, how are we not doing that back? How have we not figured out who God asked us to be and started saying, let's pour it out? Like, it is who I am now. I'm a living stone offering sacrifices to the Lord. We have to bring ourselves to life. I have to bring myself to life. And use what he's given us to serve him. And do so in a way that builds one another up. Both in this community and around the global community of Christ. In such a way that we build up that spiritual house of God. So that when the world looks in at us, they don't see all the cracks and the divisions. They see Jesus. And at that day... May his name be glorified. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for how you have gifted and used each one of us. Lord, I thank you for those in this congregation today who have used your gifting in a special way to touch my heart and my life. Lord, I ask that you would bring us to a renewed life. When we hear the gospel truth, let it not be just words or thoughts or concepts to be grasped, but let it be the source of our life that grips our hearts and causes us to share it with others. Lord, I pray that even as we go from here, even as we sing this next song, that we would offer up a song of praise, a sacrifice, pleasing in your sight. Yes, it's in Jesus' name. Amen.